welcome and thank you for standing by. For the duration of today's conference, all participants will be in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of the conference. At that time, you may press star one on your phone to ask a question. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Over to Chairman Michael Gunning. Thank you, you may begin. Awesome, thank you very much. Let's call to order the meeting of the California Housing Financing Agency Board of Directors under our revised agenda. We have a roll call, Melissa. Ms. Avila Farias. Ms. Gallagher. No. Ms. Gallagher calling in remotely. Ms. Yes, Gun I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Gunn. Here. Ms. Gunn calling in remotely. Mr. Gunning. Here. Mr. Gunning present. Mr. Hunter. Here. Mr. Hunter calling in remotely. Ms. Johnson Hall. Here. Ms. Johnson Hall calling in remotely. Ms. Genevieve Japonda for Treasurer Ma. Mr. Olmstead calling in for Acting Director McCauley. Here. Mr. Olmstead calling in remotely. Ms. Um, Secretary Castro Ramirez. Yes, I'm here. Secretary Castro Ramirez calling in remotely. Mr. Prince. Here. Mr. Prince calling in remotely. Mr. S Russell. Present. Mr. Russell calling in remotely. Ms. Sotelo. Here. Ms. Sotelo calling in remotely. Ms. Suzanne Haig. Here. Ms. Suzanne Haig calling in remotely. Ms. Gail Miller. Ms. Boatman Patterson. Here. Ms. Bowman Patterson present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, I know the operator said it, but would you mind just doing a little overview of how we're going to proceed so everyone is clear on process this morning? Sure, certainly. Today um, we are trying something different for our board meeting. We have an operator assisted call. Um, the uh, we also uh, we have board members obviously calling in remotely. We have um, a presenter calling in remotely. Um, and this is pursuant to Executive Order N25-20. We, um, we, we have the operator on the line to help assist during the comments and questions of the board members, and then we will open it up to the public, and the operator will provide instructions for the public at that time. And a reminder to the board members, since you are not present and calling in remotely, if um, prior to your question, if the operator or the board member can announce their name, that would be helpful. Thank you, Tia. That's exactly what I wanted to say. With that, why don't we move to approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to read the minutes of February 6, 2020? God, this is awkward. <laughs> Any objections? Any objections to approval of the minutes? That's how we're doing. Seeing none. <laughs> Minutes are adopted. <laughs> Item number three, um, Chairman, Executive Director comments. Um, clearly, Melissa touched on this extraordinary period of time. Um, certainly want to thank all of you for participating today. Uh, I was up late last night. The legislature, of course, passed a billion dollars to help with this crisis and also adjourned until April 13th. So at least in the legislative world, in the world of bills, everything's up in air right now. Um, so given this time, appreciate everyone's efforts, but certainly understand that work still has to go on and this important work of housing we do must continue. So I want to give thanks to the staff, certainly for quickly amending this meeting and making it happen. So thanks to everyone and kudos. Great work, team. Tia? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, COVID-19 is changing the way we do things, and today's meeting is a perfect example. I want to thank our wonderful marketing staff, legal staff, and um, executive staff who came together quickly and pivoted so that we could have this meeting and make this meeting possible. Um, the situation is fluid, as you've noted, Mr. Chair, and we are adjusting and adapting as necessary. 
We are disappointed to have to have counsel guest speaker Richard Rothstein, the author of The Color of Law, and Kevin Kish, our director of the Department of Fair Employment and uh, uh, Fair em Housing and Employment. It was necessary considering our current environment, but we look forward to future opportunities to hear from them. Yesterday, the governor's office via our Business Consumer Services Housing Agency requested the departments provide a customized continuity of operations plan for COVID-19, including any recommendations to maximize telework and minimize non-essential um, travel. Yesterday, senior staff reviewed its business continuity plan, developed a draft continuity of operation plan in response to the governor's office request, and we are utilizing our business continuity plan and making the proper preparations to ensure we are responding appropriately. I, along with the leadership team, are closely monitoring this unprecedented situation and following the guidance from the CDC, the local public health officials, the California Department of Health and Human Services, and CalHR, and Governor Newsom's executive order N25-20. Consistent with that uh, guidance um, referenced uh, above, uh, our approach we have taken to update our business continuity plan has included um, using the business continuity plan to filter for essential functions that required that we required to continue the operate uh, the agency's operations should we need to be or directed to shut down. We identified all essential employees needed to perform essential functions, um, and we have. Uh, and what employees could serve as potential backups to those employees should those employees not be available to come into the office. We, uh, consistent with the governor and the health advisories, um, we are allowing employees that self-select to take leave because of the COVID-19 to take that leave in any uh, form of which they may have uh, uh, leave credits available. That includes sick, vacation, personal time off, or leave without pay. Supervisors of essential employees may request that, in, that an employee telework if that employee is identified as an essential employee that, and there is no backup available to come into the office and that job is conducive for teleworking. Cabinet and collaborate, um, we will be working with the, our human resources department and IT to develop objective criteria to determine when a job is conducive to teleworking and we will be um, um, reviewing all of those processes. Uh, last week, you know, we did have a very um, productive trip to D.C. Uh, even though senators were focused and many of the uh, congressional representatives were co focused on the COVID-19, um, uh, I believe Frances has provided a written report of a legislative update and later on in the call during his item, he may want to provide more detail on that. I'm pleased to have Don, uh, our Chief Deputy, provide you with an update of our mid-year business, uh, uh, business plan and our budget update. It has been a very busy and productive year. Um, uh, all upcoming events, we have either canceled, <coughs> declined, or modified our participation in those, in, uh, in those future events to be consistent with the directives that have been provided. Also, I want to note that our new Secretary of Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency is joining us remotely via phone, uh, Secretary Lourdes uh, Castro Ramirez, and we are very pleased to have her join us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Tia. I, I'll just reach out and ask if any board members have comments or thoughts. Okay. None. Let's move. Mr. Chairman. Yes. This is uh, Lourdes Castro Ramirez here at uh, Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Madam Secretary, yes. Yes, I just wanted to um, just uh, share um, that we are, um, you know, BCSH and working closely with the governor's office, as Tia mentioned. Uh, we've been working 24-7 um, responding to uh, the impact of COVID uh, across the various um, programs and departments and working, you know, staying at, uh, closely with uh, stakeholders in responding to this. And so we will continue to do our best to provide the best, you know, communication and updates um, to uh, Tia and the team. Um, but I also just wanted to take an opportunity to um, say that I'm very pleased and happy to be back in California after 11 years of being in uh, Texas, um, coming back home and, um, you know, grateful for the opportunity to serve um, along with uh, 
the Newsom administration. And so I look forward to uh, getting more involved and, um, and happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome aboard, Madam Secretary. Okay. Moving on, item four, presentation on Hayes Valley. Mr. Beckman, good morning. You're up. And I believe we have Kate Ferguson on the line to also make the presentation. Yes, um, I am on the line, but Kate's going to handle this, the deal presentation. I'll be talking about the business plan. Thanks, Kate. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Beckman. I'm a loan officer here at the agency. Uh, welcome, remote board. Uh, good morning, Chair Gunning. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all. Hey. Um, I was going to share a joke, but I probably should. <laughs> Favorite silly Irish joke. Yes, with no green on. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So uh, this deal today is Hayes Valley South. It's, it's one of uh, three in a series of RAD conversions that uh, uh, we will do um, <clears throat> in December. The board heard Burnell Dwellings um, that was uh, presented by Sheena, our chief credit officer. This one's very, very similar, very, very similar in a lot of ways. But I'm going to start out by uh, a little bit of background. The, it's an existing 110-unit property, property <clears throat> built in 1999 as a Hope 6 redevelopment. It's um, eight two-story buildings in the Hayes Valley neighborhood of San Francisco. Hope 6 is a HUD program that was put together in 1992 to revitalize public housing projects um, targeting uh, very, very under-resourced areas, um, generally where there was a lot of crime and stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, <clears throat> the Hayes Valley neighborhood is now almost gentrified, so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing that's happened over time. Um, this project is one of six, Hope 6, um, public housing developments in San Francisco. <clears throat> there are 4,575 total units that are part of this RAD conversion program. Excuse me. <clears throat> and RAD's a, RAD's a really uh, nice structure. It's, a, it's another HUD program that's open to owners of public housing, including Hope Sex. And the owners of these properties can convert um, the existing operating subsidy. So in the Hope 6, they have an operating subsidy, which is kind of limiting on cash flow. They can convert to uh, what's called rental assistance demonstration, or RAD. <clears throat> RAD provides that the project can be rehabbed uh, using 4% federal tax credits and tax exempt bonds. And the biggest thing is that you can bring in a uh, Section 8 half subsidy, which really improves cash flow. So. It provides more um, stability for the tenants because they're only going to pay 30% of whatever their income is, and the project will still have cash flow and able to fund reserves and then fund uh, replacement as well. So this project has, uh, like I said, 110 units, and it's comprised of 16 one-bedroom flats, six, 69 two-bedroom flats and townhomes, 18 three-bedroom flats and townhomes and seven four-bedroom flats and townhomes. The project has 66 public housing units, um, 53 of which will be supported by a San Francisco Housing Authority project-based Section 8 HAP, and then 13 will receive a RAD rental subsidy. The other 43 um, were underwritten at just straight AMI rents because 19 of the units are not subsidized, and then another 24 have tenant-based vouchers, so we couldn't use the overhang for that. So all of those units, those 43, were just uh, underwritten at the uh, San Francisco County AMI rent. Um, the dirt is going to be leased from the San Francisco Housing Authority with a 65-year term with a 34-year extension option. Um, the lease cost has a $3.8 million upfront capitalization or a capitalized piece, and then they'll pay $15,000 per year. So the project, I'm sure as you've seen, 
uh, it's quite expensive. I think it came in at about $909,000 a door. So I'm going to walk you through some of the main components of why that is. Um, the acquisition cost uh, is, is about $34.5 million, which is $313,000 a unit. Um, it's a very, very extensive uh, rehab, uh, $38.2 million, and that's about almost another $350,000 a door. Um, they're a very robust relocation budget at $26,000 a unit. And then they're, they're going to do um, a lot of reserves are going to total probably uh, almost $68,000 a door. Um, and then obviously, you know, they've got a large developer fee, which is another $54,000. So that's why it's so expensive. Um, the, some of the stuff they're going to do with building, which is crucial, um, they're going to do some site work, uh, the parking lot needed some work, and then they're going to um, do some what they call traffic calming to slow people down in there, what is safer for the tenants. They're going to uh, not install a new roof, but they're going to upgrade the existing roof to an energy efficient, adding energy efficient insulation. Um, all of the all of the units will be completely remodeled uh, with new Energy Star appliances, flooring, cabinetry, plumbing, and paint. They're going to completely paint the exterior. They're going to remodel the management and services offices in the community room. Um, there's some ADA upgrades that are needed, and then there was a um, an environmental issue with some of the dirt, and so they're just going to excavate during the rehab one to two feet of soil to get rid of that. And, and they've already had a letter from the locality, uh, the Air Resources Board locality, saying that that's fine and that that'll work. Um, and that'll be monitored through the process. Um, I mentioned the relocation plan. The aggregate is 2.9 million, which is $26,000 a unit. Um, it's about a 19 month rehab time. Um, they'll use rolling uh, through six phases as they can. Um, they've already uh, contracted with another apartment complex, so they have off-site housing as well. And so the 26000 is going to cover that plus a healthy per diem for folks who are uh, displaced during this process. Um, let's see here. Another thing that we did for underwriting, um, we, even though we were somewhat familiar with the developer, we decided to go ahead and maximize the operating expense budget or operating expense reserve to a full 50% of uh, annual expenses at debt service. Um, also, because we wanted that to back up, be that as a backup tour, so we have that uh, into the to the plan as well. Um, let me see what else is a note. Talked about the high cost. Oh, the last thing, uh, there, there are some conditions, as you would imagine, to close. But the big one that I want to bring up is because of the timing on this, we were not able to, as we usually would, look at and review an as-built appraisal because what we do uh, in these deals where we issue and then just do the takeout financing is we share the appraisal with the construction lender. They use our guidelines and they use uh, an appraiser that's on our approved list. And so we can trust that. Um, we were able to see this before board, so I've conditioned it that we will not close, obviously, without one that's approved by Calix Bay. What I did do in underwriting, though, I reached out with one of our appraisers uh, who we consult with, and we used a really, really conservative cap of five and three quarters, which is way, way high for that area. And doing the math, the LOI at five and three quarters would be 84%. So we're well, we're well beneath the 90. So I, I'm certain that we'll be okay. Yeah, on that. Steve, would you just touch upon, um, I think you said 900,000 per year? 900,000. Yeah, that's, that's probably going to push a lot of heads back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you may mm -hmm. want to. Well, I wanted yeah. to bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you did say that three hundred and something thousand was attributed to acquisition costs, right? Correct. So, if you're just talking about hard costs for rehab, it's a, closer to six hundred. Is that correct? 
acquisition and rehab will total six sixty. Okay, so, so six sixty includes the three hundred thousand dollars per unit in seller carry back or yes. acquisition financing? Yes, and the rehab. So what were just the the hard development costs per unit? If you three hundred and forty seven thousand three hundred and twenty so that's, that's, so that's, that's a huge amount of money to put into each unit. Yeah, but that's yeah, but better that's, than nine. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. That's yeah, yeah, why that's, I wanted to make sure we clarify for the board that the actual rehab per unit is closer to three hundred thousand. Right. But that the I thought that you said just, that. So, but where was the nine hundred per unit coming from? That's the total. That's, that's the total. Everybody. That's, that's including fees, reserves, relocation. That's yeah. more acquisition and rehab was six hundred, yeah. but fees and other costs, soft costs, were bringing it up to the yeah. nine hundred. So I, I just, I highlighted the big ticket items when I walked you through that. That's what I wanted to do with that because I knew, Chair, that that was going to be nine oh nine. You know, oh, which is why I wanted correct. to get it out there correct. first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> correct. Sure and that's why I brought it up. You bet. So. Let me see if there was something else I wanted to say before recommending approval. Um, we are familiar with these folks. Uh, uh, in fact, um, we do have two or three representatives from McCormick Baron on the line, I believe. Do we have them on, Adi? They were going to call in. They may be under the public portion. And yeah, Steve, they won't be able to okay. speak because they're okay. in a listen only okay. mode. Correct. Yeah, I gave them the option. They, they to call can them. during public comment. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, if you would like to discuss anything with them, they can. They can uh, Thanks, more. Steve. At this moment, we'd like to open it up to members of the board for questions and comments. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Gunning. This is uh, Delilah Sotella. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, just as a as a point of, of um, curiosity, I was um, I was a project manager uh, with McCormick Baron Salazar when we developed Hayes Valley way back when. Uh -huh. <laughs> <In the 90s. laughs> so I'm glad it lasted 30 years. But <laughs> you did it as, but, a, as a teenager, huh? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I started when I was uh, ten years old. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's it, you know it's it's a very uh, it's a great project in the sense that you know it, it's a way to keep um, affordability and public housing uh, in an area that's quickly changing. And uh, you know, I don't think anybody expected it to go uh, you know quite as um, drastically uh, increased as it, as it has been these last 20 years. So it's great to be able to, uh, from a public sector standpoint, keep um, the affordability in place and keep public housing residents in place and keep the opportunities available uh, to residents. So I think that's great. Um, there are a couple of questions that I have with regard to the structure, um, namely the acquisition costs so of $34.4 million and how that's really being um, uh, allocated whether that is um, a loan um, that's on the books or is actually is is, is there cash out uh, in addition to the developer fee that's being generated on the project? Um, how is that financing structured um, on the acquisition side? It wasn't clear from the staff report. So there is a thirty-two million dollar seller carry back. It'll be a 55 year residual receipt loan at a little over 2% interest. And so I believe we're going to, uh, I, I think we're going to split the cash flow. Um, I know that we've worked out, we tried, we worked out uh, uh, a situation on Burnell because this was, if you remember Delilah, this is just like Burnell. And uh, this question came up before as well. And we've worked with McCormick Barron on, and in the city too, on trying to uh, see how we would distribute cash flow um, in terms of residual receipts on that. But, but that's, that's how that's financed. 
and can I get a clarifying is, question? Is that loan subordinate to our financing? Yes. Are you sure, Steve? Um, yes, because we will put it's, it's our sub subsidy loan ahead of it. Our subsidy loan is ahead yes. of the seller carryback. Correct. And the pro okay. and the and the cash flow it split it split seventy five percent twenty five percent after year six or is that yeah I'm trying to remember what we did with that yeah yeah and and um, we we talked to the city about it and and we we have an arrangement so um, how we're going to do that uh, I know that we wanted to um, actually get more cash flow towards our subsidy loan, but the the city wasn't going to work with us on that, so. So Steve, the total um, acquisition cost is what? The total acquisition cost is... The staff report seems to say that it's $34.4 million or 313 yeah, so, million per unit. Yeah. So, the, so the seller carryback, Delilah, as you can see, is, is the bulk of the acquisition cost. Yes. I I'm, I'm think I'm a little confused. So if the, the, the acquisition cost is 34, but the seller carryback is 32, that means we have $2 million. That is that, where's that $2 million going? Well, there are some other gap lending that's being provided by the Mayor's Office of Housing, and there, there is actually another, um, it, it, it's comprised of, so the, the acquisition price is comprised of the existing reserves of one point, you know, one million, and, and some other things. And so there are some other sources of soft lending that, that take are, care of that. That are included that, in the seller care. That step back, that step in, yes. So I think that's the bigger question. How did we come about the amount of the seller carry back? Because if there was no appraisal done, the seller carry back is based on what? Well, there, there was, there was a, an existing appraisal okay. done that supports that value. And actually, I wish I had Adi on to walk through the details of, of that because it, like I said, it was very, very similar to Bernal when, uh, when Sheena went through this, yeah. Yeah, it, it's difficult to recall the details of, of Bernal dwellings. Uh, right. But I think that my, my question is really centered around, it looks like there's a $2 million developer fee, I mean a $2 million uh, GB contribution. So that may be the difference between the 34 right. and the 32 million dollars on the Delilah, project. I believe you're correct because when I did get to see a structure when they were trying to explain this to us, because there were a lot of questions, Sheena had a lot of questions on this, and how did they arrive at this? And so that's part of it. <clears throat> so, so my recommendation is, is certainly to go forward with the permanent loan, and I think the permanent loan is important. Um, I, I'm less compelled on the subsidy loan and the justification of contributing $3.5 million of college state subsidy loan if, if in fact, you know, we're not able to evidence an actual gap that's being created or, or needed. Um, so I just, um, I think that's where my line of questioning is. I'm completely supportive, but again, of restructuring and, and creating the permanent loan, but I just would like the team and staff to take a look at the 3.5 subsidy uh, requirements. Since that is such a valuable asset for CalHFA, I want to make sure that um, you know it is it is truly needed in support of the gap, as opposed to um, you know providing a um, cash cash out on the on the on the loan. I mean on the carryback loan or you know additional developer fee on the project. Uh, and this is this is Preston. As having experienced Calichefe staff on our transactions, I know it's not having to do with this one. Uh, they scrutinize uh, the subsidy uh, on uh, the projects that we're looking at closing or have closed recently. So uh, I just wanted to throw that in there that I do feel like staff goes through a pretty extensive process. But I think documenting it and being able to share that is what is being asked. I totally agree with yeah. you. Um, 
Thank you, Preston. Thanks for that. This is Kate and Delilah. I completely understand what you're saying. Let us get that detail to you. I'm I'm sure that we did that. Um, Sheena is not in the room today, so um, if we can follow up with you on that specifically, we'd be happy to. Because I can't imagine they're being nicer to McCormick Barron than they are to, to Franklin Housing. That's all I know. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and, and, and McCormick Barron is very deserving of of the subsidy and straight that they, you know, that they're recapitalizing this project and yeah, you know, okay. completely supportive of the project. But can I, 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 can, I can I jump in? Because I'm I, I actually I, I feel like I'm going to step on your toes, and I don't mean to, but I think that there's a couple of policy things. They have to be discussed in addition to what you talked about with the subsidy assistance. Um, so one, I'm glad you went through the conversation of the cost per unit. Um, we just had a board meeting today here in Fresno about a 600,000 per unit uh, development cost um, for No Place Like Home project. Um, and so this is like a, a really big conversation to be able to break down what's inside the cost and why, why is the, uh, the cost skyrocketing, particularly in a time when we know we have so many people who need assistance, limited resources, and we need to figure out ways to deliver that housing. So the conversation around acquisition costs is really about um, having an acquisition price that creates acquisition credits, um, and then the seller's note um, really uh, makes it so that it's a wash. Yes, it's at 900000 but it, that really is a, a mechanism to generate equity, and I can't off the top of my head uh, say what the equity is off of 300000 per unit, but pretty substantial. So um, I think maybe doing a little bit of analysis about uh, why that acquisition is so high and what does that trigger uh, in terms of uh, equity coming in is, is, uh, would be helpful. Uh, here's where I'm a little bit concerned about policy, which is a property that is 20 years old needing 300000 per unit of renovation. Um, I'm not saying that what happened there 20 years ago was wrong, but I want to be clear about as we do underwriting for projects moving forward, we keep pushing down uh, as an investor or as a lender on, on uh, the construction. Uh, and I'm just worried that if we don't do appropriate construction up front, that then what we face is a project that needs substantial renovation in 20 years. That's just not a very long period of time. So it's all about the underwriting uh, and really uh, looking at that policy conversation of, of what is necessary in terms of, uh, of construction up front. I also get it since it was a HOPE 6 and it had public housing funds and we know what has happened over the last 20 years. Sorry, Secretary, while you were out, it happened as well. Um, but the defunding of capital funds and uh, uh, at public housing led to this kind of situation. Uh, and so we need to make sure we have underwriting in place that allows for a property to be successful. The capitalized reserves makes so much sense to me, and I think it's the right thing to be doing. So I think there's some great policy conversations that do drive up the cost. Um, uh, or potentially can drive up the cost, but I, I, I feel like we need to be putting those policy conversations outside of a deal transaction conversation uh, and really saying, here's what we want to be doing. Uh, so I also will be supporting this. I think it's great that it's going to be, uh, I do not agree with the comment that this is going to mean affordability for the families because they have affordability right now under public housing. It should be seamless for them, but it will, uh, create a platform that will ensure renovations and repairs happen in a timely manner. So hopefully in 20 years it doesn't have to be financed uh, again. But uh, I, I do think that this is great the way we're moving forward. Just want to make sure we look at the policy stuff. Thanks. Let me toss in a comment. Um, so we were able to do Burnell Dwellings, the way it was structured, and it, it was, uh, you know, a large bond issue. This one's 50 million and about 24.1 uh, in a perm in the, the subsidy. <clears throat> we were able to do, we were able to give them a term on the permanent loan um, that is a balloon. And that was one of the last ones we could do because our HUD waiver um, sunset it. So now we have this one coming along and <clears throat> we can't 
provide a similar term, which would be a lower interest rate to them. So we're doing a 35-year fully amortizing loan and the interest rate that goes with it. The third project, Hayes North, that we were assuming that we were going to do, <clears throat> we're now just going to be the conduit issuer because they were able to go find uh, money that was cheap enough, interestingly enough, uh, with a different term and lower interest rate where they didn't even need the three and a half million dollar subsidy. So that's kind of where we're at right now in the, the um, kind of evolution of all three of these projects and, and Talia Bay's um, participation in them. Steve, just other question on that note. With the Fed lowering the rate, shouldn't that make this better? Or have we gone out and market with bonds yet? Or does that, yeah, I don't. you think that's going to impact? That would be a 10 question, probably. Um, I know that on the PERM side, um, we're using MMD, and MMD has gone way down. Now it's gone back up. And so they're actually, the, the developers are asking me about is there a chance that we could, uh, because you know, we can grow the size of the perm 7% without coming back to board and stuff. And so we're having those discussions. But um, um, yeah, Tim could probably speak to you know, what's going on with, with the bonds and stuff you know, and, and everything like that. My whole point was, yes, the first two were structured with a $3.5 million subsidy. Mm -hmm. and, and I get it, and we really do need to be, this is precious. Um, but I just found it interesting that Hayes North, they were able to go to city and get money so cheap that they didn't even need the three and a half month. So, and we're, so they probably are getting the 3517 with correct, city. Correct. And because we don't have that in our financing tool because our thirty our waiver to do a 3517 expired on December 31st, we do have a waiver request in. And so should we get that waiver request, we w would potentially be able to restructure the perm loan to be a 3517. Um, uh, would we need to come back to the board should that waiver request come in and we're able to restructure this um, perm loan a a instead of a risk share uh, with a 35 year, but have a HUD risk share with a 35 year 17 and we're able to lower the interest rate? That's a question about your authority under the financing resolution. Mm -hmm. I do not believe so, but I should look at it more closely and come back and give you a definitive response on that. All right. So um, that's one of the things we'll circle back with. Um, mm -hmm. HUD, HUD had been very slow in getting back our waivers. And upon meeting with them in January and meeting with them again, most recently we went to DC, those waivers are rolling in more quickly. And so, um, it, it, it's kind of up in the air, but there is a potential that we may be able to lower the interest rate and, and therefore lower the subsidy amount if we're able to lower the interest rate and they can take on more perm uh, first lien position. Well, Claire, I guess that raises the question, if we approve it as it is today and it gets better, it would seem to be in the staff's discretion. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I would just like to review Double it. check, okay. Yes. And, and here's another thing I've run into, uh, and this is regarding subsidy, and because it's intuitive that if we can give them more perm, then let's reduce the subsidy. What I've run into on with another developer, <clears throat> and now this is just with Alliant Capital, I don't know if all of the tax credit investors are like this, but something happens, they focus on the subsidy amount and when we try to reduce it, it causes this huge problem with them pricing the tax credits and all this kind of stuff. So I, that's a headwind that I've run into. Um, Recently? Yes, ma'am. That's a ripple. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. And it's I, and I thought and I don't know all the ins and outs about pricing and those mechanisms and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But it seems like there's something about our subsidy that allows them to price at a certain level that if we do what we think is right and reduce it because we can increase the perm, then it throws this whole thing into and a it, tizzy. It, it brings this, the, the pricing for the tax credits down. Yes. Was this one yeah. that, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this is Kate. Um, the, uh, McCormick Baron is on the phone. 
Uh, would you like me to give them the um, the code so that they can speak to some of these questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, can we address the, all of the questions first, maybe, and then open up the line, or if it's easier to have them on the line first? Yeah, I think the board we should get work. all of its questions, and then we can have them bring them in. I'll also, stop. okay, I'm, I will give them the code and tell them to hang on until we ask them a question. Okay, and and one more, and then we need to see if there's other. Uh, questions from other board members. Kate and multifamily staff, is this one in which you consider a, the, the uh, maybe a participation with city so that we can do a different form of risk share so that it can be a risk share city participation and perhaps look at 3517 and lower the interest rate with the city participation in this loan? Is that a, a mechanism that we looked at? Uh, no, because the city um, conversation that we've had has um, largely been around new production. That doesn't mean that we couldn't have that discussion, but, um, and that, you know, that deal is not um, big yet, shall we say. But this is a potential where we could <clears throat> expand and talk about I'm, that partnership. Yeah, I'm happy to have that discussion. Okay. Any uh, other board members with questions? Yes, uh, Lourdes. Uh, I have a, um, going back to maybe this is more of a policy conversation as Preston mentioned, but under um, the affordability um, piece from, I guess, section 12, and looking at the rent limit summary uh, table, I don't see any units at 30 and 40 percent. And I know we've talked about the um, public housing units, but um, can you sort of elaborate on that, you know, given that uh, you know, the, the need may be greatest at the 30 and 40 percent? Um, just, just want to understand why we're not seeing any units at that level. Well, the only way I can respond is that the existing project um, did, did not have any units at 30s and 40s. Um, and I think they're keeping the same affordability restrictions. So do we have the ability to be able to um, ask that they um, reconsider the affordability mix? So does the existing regulatory agreement that uh, either the Housing Authority of the City and County of San Francisco or the City and County of San Francisco have any regulated units at 30 and 40? No. So reducing it or asking for additional affordability would um, increase. increase the subsidy and reduce the cash flow? It, well, if those units were not under the hat. If they're under the half, then they're golden because you're going to get contract rents. But the half doesn't cover all the units. It'd be an easy answer if the half covered all 109 or whatever. So how many units does the half cover? The half covers. What did I say? The half covers. 53 of the 110. So um, that's one of the questions we should ask when the developer gets on the line. Consideration of um, re uh, regulating some of the units that are covered under the HAP so that we can get deeper affordability. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Claire, please. Uh, Claire Tarannan, Board Secretary. <clears throat> With respect to the question posed regarding the um, HUD 3517 waiver that's pending, uh, in the event that the board approves such, we could uh, currently, <clears throat> sorry, amend the existing resolution so that if our existing finance resolutions don't give uh, Ms. Patterson the ability to do so, the board could do so via this resolution. And I can propose some language for that if the board is amenable to consider it. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Yes, this is Eileen Gallagher. I have uh, three quick questions, two technical and one kind of market related. Um, 
technical question, just want to make sure I heard correctly, the page three of the staff report talks about the acquisition cost being set by the city, but then there's also a reference to the land and improvement value being supported by an audit. So I just want to make sure I heard that clearly with the earlier conversation. Second question is just the question about the earthquake waiver. Just wanted just to see what that, the significance of that. And then the third comment really is about the market rates and um, uh, just from what we're seeing in the municipal markets, while the treasury rates are obviously low, we're seeing municipal rates rise sharply and dramatically and credit spread widen considerably. And so my question is, both in this project and others, are assumptions for underwriting maybe changing pretty radically here and that 50 basis point cushion, I don't know when that was set, but that's not a very big cushion in this moment's market, at least. And so just how we're handling those kind of changes as we, as we sort of, as the market digests um, the disruption. Yes, this is Kate, and you're absolutely right. And Sheena and I have been um, talking about, um, we are actually in the process of reviewing all of our underwriting guidelines. But that is specifically one that um, as we go forward, we're going to keep a very close eye on. I agree with you. So you may see you you may see us come back and you know as deals new deals come in, I would expect that we will inflate that at some point. But we're doing the analysis now. Steve, can you answer? Thank you the board, uh, board members mm -hmm. first two questions about mm -hmm. the acquisition costs and then the earthquake waiver? Uh, I'll go with the easy one first. Uh, the earthquake waiver uh, is based on a study that they, uh, they got and was reviewed by our construction inspector and it shows uh, a PML of less than 20 percent after construction. PML? Uh, excuse me, probable maximum loss of less than 20%, I'm sorry. In San Francisco? Correct, yeah, in San Francisco. So that's why we didn't, yeah, that's why you don't see that. I know, well, believe it or not, there's places where you would, I mean, certainly not down in the marina, you know, but there's places where we've seen those, you know, where after construction, yeah, so, um, that's what we're going on. That's that's what we're going on for that. Um, and then the first question is the 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 acquisition is supported by an appraisal, and um, I, I, I and I think that when we get the developer on, they can give you a there's a structure uh, to how this this cost comes up and and how it's put together. And I think that that will be uh, more revealing and, and could answer your question uh, more correctly. Is the developer on yet? We're going to yeah. This is Avi. Can you hear me? Oh, good. OK, I um, so well. hang on, and I'll refer to you when they're ready for you to answer questions, Avi. Any other board members? Any other questions from board members? Do you want to hear from the developer, Mr. Chair? Yes, we do. Thank you, Dan. All right, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, Avi Nagraj, Senior Vice President of McCormick Grand Salazar. Um, Jimmy is uh, on the phone as well, and he is the finance manager for MBS. Um, I'll kind of start addressing a few of the, a few of the questions um, that came up. And Pauline is going to join us too. And Pauline, if you can hear me, the passcode is on your email um, to join us. Um, so, uh, right, this is one, this is a second of a series of three large rehabs that we're pleased to be bringing to you. Um, Bernal, construction, uh, Bernal Dwellings has been discussed. Um, we were grateful to get approvals from this body in December, started construction in January, um, of all, including all the rehab work that, similar to what um, Steve has talked about for this project. Um, for Hayes South, um, we are, um, uh, requesting approval today of the three and a half million dollar soft loan, as well as the other kind of affiliated approvals, including the perm loan. And I'm just kind of jotting down a few of the questions that came up. Um, it's really it's a uh, it's hard to be asked so many questions and being on mute when you want to answer them. Um, 
but I'll, I'll start with a few um, things that I can answer, and then um, Jimmy can talk through more of the financing and the flow of funds and the acquisition value. Um, so essentially, yes, they're, they're, um, the construction costs as we're seeing across the Bay Area are, are higher than we all want right now. Um, what we're doing with this scope of work is providing a building that does not um, need to be rehabbing it in 20 years, and I totally appreciate that point, that um, we want to, our mentality is like, you know, the TTAC regulatory um, restrictions are 55 years, and we want a building that's going to last for 50 years. And so the scope of work that we're doing is making it um, uh, safe for people to live for the long term. A lot of the scope of work is driven by soil excavation. Um, a lot of it is driven by things that were not required 20 years ago, so there's a new level of cleanliness of soil that we did not have 20 years ago in the city or state building code. Um, so we're doing a lot of soil excavation, taking it off site to um, fills that will accept the soil. Um, we're doing a lot of um, siding and, and uh, window repair work because there's been leaks coming through the windows, and as we all know, water intrusion can lead to things that we don't want to have happen within the unit. Um, we're, uh, um, you know, certainly kind of doing some cosmetic stuff within the units as well. They're, they're not a big cost driver, but given the um, massive disruption for two years or so in these residents' lives, we do think that, you know, cabinets and flooring, um, not a big cost driver, but, um, you know, something that will make the building enjoyable for the residents to live in. Um, the big picture, we are working with the city of San Francisco to help provide a gap loan in this project. Um, and so the three and a half million is needed because um, that is helping to maintain a level of gap loan that the city of San Francisco is gonna be able to provide um, us on this project. Um, the, perm, the PERM loan, I'm just kind of going through my notes with a few questions that were asked. The PERM loan has decreased, as Steve said, um, uh, while treasuries have been dropping, the cash to pay loan product, my understanding, is based on MMD, the, the municipal bond rate. And essentially, a lot of folks have been dumping munis to go either in all cash or treasuries. So the muni indexes are showing a higher interest rate. And so any, any loan that's indexed to the muni bond rate is going to have a higher interest rate. And that's just kind of an unfortunate consequence of what we've been seeing over the last several weeks. Um, so we have, this of course is a partnership as well with the um, Housing Authority and HUD. Um, and we've applied for and received 4% tax credits and tax exempt bonds. Our tax credits and bonds um, expire in early June. And um, we've got to still go through a litany of HUD approvals um, if, we're, if we're able to receive approvals today from this body. Um, we'll still need to go through a number of HUD approvals that are contingent upon receiving approvals today. And so we're kind of butting up against an early June close, um, which is essentially early June is when our tax credits and bonds um, expire. And so if they expire, then we need to return those credits and bonds and reapply, which we, of course, don't want to do. So that's the kind of driving the timing of requesting approvals today. Um, so I'll pause there. And Jimmy, if you're OK with it, um, there are just a few questions on acquisition value. Um, and, and let me just, and before getting started, let me just say one thing about acquisition, which is um, we're using, the financing mechanism we're using is the seller take-back note. So the, um, we're taking out a loan from the seller, from the housing authority, to finance the acquisition of the improvements. Um, there, it is a high number, um, and so that, you know, on a per unit basis, it inflates the total development cost if you throw the acquisition value into your TDC. Um, I would say the benefit of a high acquisition value is that we can leverage acquisition tax credits based on acquisition value. So um, the, it, is, it, it just follows that the higher the acquisition value, the more tax credits we can leverage um, and the more equity comes into the project. And then the smaller the kind of gap is um, that the city or the housing authority or Cal HFA, um would be requested to fill. So there is an upside, of, there's a tremendous upside of having a large acquisition value like we see across um, the board in San Francisco and like we saw for Bernal as well. And, um, and so Adi, pause there. Adi yeah. this is Tia, and the seller, 
uh, carry back um, is the, the, uh, the amount of that acquisition is supported by a um, appraisal? That's right. And can you speak to the deeper affordability that the secretary um, spoke to? Um, one of the policies of our subsidy funding is longer or depth of affordability. And so what would be what would be the consequences or the impact of getting deeper affordability or deep on on some of the units that are covered by the HAP contract? Um, yes, I will actually um, Jimmy, if you're he's been deeper in those conversations. Um, so I will Jim, if you could address Tia's question and then and after that talk about acquisition value. I will say as a practical matter, um, under state and federal and San Francisco laws, um, everyone who has moved off-site is going to return to the building, and they are going to be paying kind of the same. If they're paying 30% of their income as rent, they're still going to be paying 30% of their income as rent. So, from their perspective, they're not going to see any um, any change in rent structure after they come back to their to the to the apartment. I, I but do. Jimmy, can you address? I do appreciate yeah. that, but understanding that we do have a policy that with our subsidy we are likely to see deeper regulated units as well understood so hi can you guys hear me this is jimmy hello yes hi, we hear you. Go. <laughs> hi so this is jimmy so, yeah, so just to kind of address um just a latter question i think from a practical perspective we've already kind of gone through the process with with TCAC and said like in terms of the application that we submitted and the the income limits and whatnot and also we're in the process with HUD already in submitting our financing plan which represents the deal at the current income structure so I think from that kind of perspective the wheels are already in motion and trying to kind of um, go back might be a complication in order for us to close by June 1st. Um, I think, for, uh, on the other hand, in terms of how that'll impact the underwriting, I, I believe you said that, you know, what the impact is to the units with a project-based voucher. Um, so if we were to, if we were to, I guess, reduce the income limits for those units, um, the, the subsidy will still kind of provide up to the payment standards or the amount that we had negotiated with the housing authority. So as it currently stands, tenants will essentially continue to pay 30% of their income. Um, but if the unit turns over, then the unit would have to be rented to a, to a person or a family uh, making you know, 40% or 30%, whatever the deeper target affordability might be. So, but the payment standards would still continue to kind of pay the difference. Um, the other question, I guess, on that is whether or not the city would be open to that, to, to that conversation, given that, you know, the housing authority is going through, you know, is going through some, going through some, you know, some issues right now. Um, the city would have to kind of backstop the difference between that. So I think that would be a larger conversation with the Housing Authority and then also the city of San Francisco. Understood. But we're not losing mm -hmm. affordability in this this new transaction. No, we're not. We're, it, we're not. essentially carrying forward the, the income restrictions and possibly even lowering some of those restrictions um that moving forward because mo as part of the city they're requiring they're requiring that all units essentially um the housing authority units and any units with rad or pbv be capped at 50 percent of the city of san francisco income limits and if this percent of obviously san francisco is is significantly lower than the state standards so when these units are regulated, the 50% AMI units, they're going to be regulated at the city and county of San Francisco AMI? Correct. So yes, correct, because they are the most restrictive. Did you know, if, this is Lourdes, do you know if the Housing Authority um, continues to um, follow the policy that 75% um, of all, I guess, new um, 
public housing um, applicants must be extremely low income. So if that's the case, then what I'm hearing you say is that priority is, of course, to the individuals that live there and not, uh, and really, you know, no change to the, their rent structure. But if a unit becomes vacant and it's a public housing unit, um, then that public housing unit would be um, the, the, I guess, the, the housing authority waiting list um, would be used, at which point um, they would prioritize extremely low income. Is, is that correct? Or is I, um, yeah, this is Adi. Um, yeah, so we would use the San, we would use the San Francisco Housing Authority wait list to lease up units. I know um, I know that SFHA has a 50% AMI max, um, and so I, I don't know. Honestly, I have not heard um, whether the Housing Authority has a requirement that 75% of the folks have to be extremely low income. Um, we're just, we've just been talking to them about extending their current income restriction, which is 50% of AMI, and then the city of, and then the city of San Francisco's 50% of AMI restriction on top of that will, would more deeply restrict the tenants than they are right now, um, because right now they don't have the city restrictions on the units. But I don't know specifically about that 75% number. Board members, do you have any other questions of the developer? Great. Hi, Tito. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I can also go through the, I think there was a question in terms of the acquisition cost versus the seller take back and what the difference amounts to. Do you, would you want me to go through that? Yes, yes. please. <laughs> okay. So the acquisition cost is, um, as mentioned before, supported by an appraisal that was conducted a couple months ago. And the acquisition cost, essentially, what you're seeing in the staff report is the $33 million plus the acquisition of the existing reserves. Since that's a, a partnership asset, we'll also have to acquire those reserves in order to put back into the deal. So the total acquisition cost is about, about $34 million. How that differs from the seller take back and how the seller take back note is kind of size is that um, there are two components that we have to I guess, factor in for the seller take back. So the seller take back is the appraised value plus all the reserves. So that would be $34 million or so actually you know, just about $34 million. Um, but you also, we also have to subtract out two components, one being the repayment of the permanent debt. So there's a permanent mortgage um, held by Gershman here that we have to pay down, that we have to pay down. The second component is about a million dollars that we have to use to facilitate the exit of the investor. So those two components um, is, amount to the difference of uh, the acquisition cost versus the seller take back. All right, any other questions, comments from board members or staff? Uh, this is Preston. I totally appreciated the comments about cost control, or not cost control, but not having to refinance. And so I would love uh, um, maybe down the road uh, to partner, Kelly Tefe to partner with McCormick Barron just to help us understand what you think happened in that 20 years. I know some of that's the HUD operating assistance, some of that's the construction requirements 20 years ago, but I would just love some ideas um, and because I think that that can help us as we think about our underwriting policies as a board. Good thought. Yeah, absolutely. This is obvious. Yeah. Happy to do that. And this is Kate. We're happy to do that. Good. All right. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, uh, I like to the Hold on. 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 Hold on.
um, amendment to the resolution that would provide some flexibility should we be able to get a HUD waiver and reduce the interest rate. That's correct. Uh, board members, I'd like to propose the following language, please. Um, subject to HUD 3517 authorization, the executive director is authorized to modify existing financing terms, period. Is that acceptable to the board? Acceptable to me. Anyone else? Is that okay with the board? I, I, I move approval as amended. Hold on. Before you do that, can we repeat? The, can we repeat it one more time, Board Member Tina? Yes, ma'am. I'm happy to repeat. The language I'm proposing to the board is subject to HUD 3517 authorization. The executive director is hereby authorized to modify existing financing terms. Period. We actually want Thank them to be better terms, <laughs> right? So. Let me offer a little bit of different language. And it's not just a 3517, we may want a 4017, so it's a balloon waiver. Okay. So subject to a balloon waiver offering more favorable terms, mm -hmm. the executive director. Yeah, I think that's better. Ms. Jo Ms. Johnson Hall, is that? Yes, that is acceptable. Great suggestion. So we have a motion by Ms. Sotelo. Well, to, do we have as to amended. this resolution? As amended. As, as amended? Okay. As amended. Is there a second? Uh, Ms. Johnson Hall, I second. There's been a motion and a second. Melissa, you read the roll call? Yes. Um, Ms. Avila Farias. Ms. Gallagher. Uh, yes. Ms. Gunn? Yes. Mr. Gunning? Aye. Mr. Hunter? M Mr. Hunter? Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall? Yes. Ms. Joponda? Yes. Mr. Olmstead? Yes. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Yes. Mr. Prince? Yes. Mr. Russell? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Yes. Resolution 20 03 is approved. As amended. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving along to item number six, resolution 2004. Six or five, sorry. I thought we just did, that's yeah. right, we're so, on item number yeah. five. Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, yes. we have the press here and they would just like to come in and take a couple photographs. As long as they stay there six feet away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll just do that right now. Sorry for the interruption, but then we can, can we can't just carry on whatever they're doing, what they're doing. We can't. We're not gonna stop. We can't. Okay. Yeah. Did you join the um, AP, Tim? Sorry. Did you join the AP? Okay. Sorry for those of you on the phone. We have the press in here, so we're adjusting. I had to powder my nose. Um, moving on to item number five, resolution 20-03. Who's presenting on this one? Issuance of bonds, is that you, Tim? It is I. Mr. Hughes, who's sitting down and getting ready to speak with us. As he Clorox wipes his no, computer. No, I, 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 I want to just be able to just make this open without touching anything. Get out of here. <laughs> Let's just begin to that. And you the floor is yours. And you don't have to get too close, Tim. They can hear you. Okay. So good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of the board. Um, first, I want to go back to respond to a comment made earlier about, um, from Eileen in particular, about um, what's happening in the capital markets in general. Um, I think what 
I feel like it's a little bit deja vu all over again in the sense that in the normal market, I think that there's a lot of correlation that people can sort of rely on to happen. Like if this goes up, that goes down and things like that. Um, but what people have seen over the course of the last couple of weeks is that there were days in which the bid and ask spread on treasuries were actually very wide. And there were days in which gold actually went down. As a matter of fact, the year to day number on gold is actually down, not up. Um, so what's happening now is um, it's, extreme, it's extraordinary to say the least. Um, and there is a lack of, um, there's really not a direct relationship between what's happening to treasuries and to, as to MMD. Um, so there's a lot of things that we typically would expect that's really not happening because there's such a, um, a panic uh, in general. And you can see some of these things that, um, who would have thought that you know, Fed would bring back QE, so you know, quali qualitative easing um, so quickly. Um, and the kind of stuff that's happening in the Treasury overnight repo market, all that stuff in, 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 in sort of um, t taken together uh, suggests that this is, this is a very uh, wacky market in which um, there is a lot of what we call basis risk, meaning that things don't move um, in a way that we expect. Um, and is, is there going to be a lot of risk in um, pricing these loans um, in which we are committing to uh, locking, on, uh, locking in a rate uh, on an execution that we think we can execute today? Um, yes, there is a lot of that kind of sort of risk embedded in lending in general. Um, and there's probably more risk like that today than before. Um, having said that, um, on, on that happy note, I'd like to transition to some of the things that we typically ask the board at the March board meeting, um, these financing resolutions. But before I talk about the financing resolutions, I would also like to talk about a couple things as follow-up items on things that were discussed last year. Um, so I'd like to talk to the board about some, some new rules on continuing disclosure. And this is um, a follow-up on um, a presentation that was made to the board in May of last year about um, new disclosure rules promulgated by SEC. And um, I believe that Eileen, um, board member Eileen Gallagher had also asked about um, what the staff is doing with respect to these rules. Um, so this is um, a, a, a response to um, Eileen's request. So in short, I don't want to go through the whole presentation again. What I do want to do is that I want to share with you what the board, what the staff has done, um, again, in response to the rule and also Eileen's request. Uh, in short, these new rules are amendments to an exi existing SEC rule on disclosure, uh, Rule 15C-212. Um, and in short, it suggests that um, if an issuer were to incur financial obligations that it deemed to be material that needs to be disclosed, even if it's not related to a bond issuance or a bond indenture. Um, these rules kicked in on February 27 of 2019. But having said that, uh, the issuer does need to uh, issue bonds that trigger these rules uh, post February 27. Um, but last year in 2019, we, didn't, we did not actually issue any bonds that would have triggered these rules. So technically, these rules do not apply to us at this point in time. Um, but the updating of our disclosure policy and practices is in preparation that one day we would trigger over these rules, and we would have to comply with them. So we're setting up, you know, we modify internal procedures. We're setting out our process procedures to gather these events. So when we do have to disclose them to Emma, we would. So what are some of the things that we did in updating our internal disclosure policy? Oh, by the way, I should mention that <clears throat> the new updated disclosure policy is in the board packet. So if you uh, like to see some of the differences, uh, some of the edits, you can see it in the, in the attachment. Um, what are some of the things that we added? Um, basically, what I envisioned was an all-encompassing internal disclosure document that that sort of encompasses everything that we do in terms of disclosure. There are some sort of um, obscure rules that we sort of have to comply with as a housing issuer of 15 uh, GA1 and 15 GA2. Uh, we uh, incorporated uh, those 
disclosures into our disclosure, its disclosure policy. There's also an effort to track our non-compliant event over the last five years, and that also is incorporated as part of our disclosure policy. Um, so <clears throat> non-compliant, they sound really alarming, but they include literally everything that is you know, technically non-compliant. So for example, the board might know that um, in the last year or two, our financials have not been able to close and um, audit have not been able to complete it on time because uh, we haven't had the OPEB numbers from the controller's office on time to finish our audit in time for our uh, disclosure requirement of 180 days from the end of the fiscal period. So we track all that stuff, and now all that stuff is now attached to the internal disclosure policy. Um, and what we also spend a lot of time on uh, is a decision tree, what I call operation decision tree, on disclosing, uh, on disclosing material events under different circumstances. And here, we really look hard at sort of a lot of things that we've done in the past. And this is attached to, to the end of this, the, this disclosure policy. And here, what we did was that we looked back on the various things that we've done in the past. And some of it has to deal with private placements. Uh, some of it has to deal with certain type of activities that happen away from the bonds and said that, well, are these considered to be material events? And, and when, we, when we execute them in a certain way, um, would they require a disclosure? And if they were to require disclosure, what would they be disclosed to, like which QSIPs? So I think there's uh, a sample of that at the end of the disclosure policy as well. And, and last but not least is that um, we are also trying to meet more regu regularly as a disclosure oversight committee to look at things such as um, the management discussion in our financials and also that um, there, since now that this particular rule would, uh, would, would implicate um, things that we do away from the bonds uh, in other, um, let's say, material um, financial obligations that, 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 that the agency enters into, there's a more, that's, that's a greater need for, um, let's say, senior or executive staff to gather to talk about the things that are happening across the agency. Um, and can, can I just interrupt you real quick? The updated disclosure policy can be found in report, in, under your reports, which is item 10. Um, a, Calichipe's disclosure policy, which starts on page 77 and your binder materials, and the attachment that Mr. Sue is talking about, which goes through the decision tree, is um, starts on page 96. And I want to give a shout out to the finance staff, and specifically Dakota Neal, who started some of these processes. This was a lot of work, an extensive amount of work that the finance team came together to make sure that they had put together this decision tree meeting on a regular basis to comply with this new SEC rule. So I have to give a shout out to Tim and the finance team on how they have come together and put all of this together. Thank you, Tim. So thank you, Tim. Sorry for the interruption. No, it's OK. Sorry that um, I, I didn't quite reference where these documents are. Um, so the last thing I would leave you with uh, on this, and it is uh, related to the financing resolutions as well, is that um, for in the attachment to the board, there is also an official statement of the last bond issue that we issued using CalHFA credit. So this is a, a multifamily housing revenue bonds three 2018 series A. Um, I'm not exactly sure whether that is in your package. Um, what I want to highlight here is that um, this particular document is a document that we put together when we issue bonds. It's very typical uh, in terms of disclosure document for a bond issuance. It's broken up in, in large part into part one and part two. So part one describes the actual security or the bond that you are issuing, that we are issuing. And part two describes the agency, you know, its financials, its board of directors, its management, its programs, and so on and so forth. I would like to highlight that on part two of this document, on page two and three of this document, on page two and three of the part two of this document, um, I want to sort of highlight that um, the board members 
uh, for Cao Chefe at that particular time of issuance, it is listed on the disclosure document as well. So then this current one for Hayes Valley, is that what you're saying? Because this is reflective of the old one. So the Hayes Valley is a conduit issuance. So that's a little bit different. So we, we issue bonds using our credit, and then we issue bonds away from um, using cash based credit as in like as a conduit issuance. We refer to it as a conduit issuance. Um, on the conduit issuance, the agency has limited financial op, you know, liability on them, if you will. Um, and that's a different kind of bond than this bond that I'm re referencing, in which um, <coughs> HFA's credit um, is pledged. We're, we're, we pledge our general obligation to make sure that that bond is OK. On conduit, we do not. So I just want to highlight, sort of make the connection and highlight some of those things um, for the board to sort of uh, be aware of so that um, when we approve these financing resolutions and we use the authority vested in us to uh, issue bonds, um, when we issue bonds, the whole management structure of Cal Chiffre and its board members at the time of the issuance is disclosed to the bondholders. I just want to make sure that I sort of make that connection um, because it's not and, and the other thing I would say is that, as I said earlier, that we also have um, not, we did not issue bonds in 2019. And um, that also sort of evidences how much our business model has changed over time. Um, despite, later on we'll report to you how much business we're doing. So much of it is away from bonds, uh, but there's still a need to have a bond resolutions uh, approved by the board. Um, and ha having said that, too, I think that the board also realize, realizes that we now have this, since TIA came on board, we also have an explicit resolution that speaks to the non-bond um, financing executions as, as, as compared to the bonds. And I'm going to go through that as I go through the resolutions. So I'll pause there to see if any, if there's any questions in terms of the disclosure. And then I can go through the financing resolutions. Any questions from uh, board members? All right. Okay. So moving on to agenda item five. As a group, agenda five to nine, which is um, of five resolutions, they are the annual resolutions as staff bring to the board for consideration and authorization. And together, they provide the authority to finance the business plan that the board then approves in May. Um, I started with multifamily this year because we don't really expect to issue single family bonds this year. So resolution 2004 is the multifamily bond finance resolution. Um, first, I would say that unlike the business plan, which is on fiscal year of 7-1 to 6-30, these resolutions are on a calendar year, so they're, they're meant to cover our activities for 2020 plus the three months of 2021 until we have a March board meeting of 2021. Um, in general, the bond financing resolution says that we, we, are, we, we are given the authority by the board to issue bonds if we were to acquire volume cap from SIDLAC. Having said that, the two things I highlighted on this slide, this is slide number four now, um, are two activities that do not um, necessarily require volume cap from SIDLAC, in which the board is giving us a not to exceed dollar amount to issue. So for example, um, we could do new money bonds not to exceed $250 million if there are for 501c3, or they do not, they are not private activity volume cap bonds or if they're not tax exempt. And um, I say that non-tax exempt on purpose because it doesn't have to be taxable. Um, they could just be a pass-through instrument like we're doing with the city securizations. Um, and in this particular resolution, it also allows us to do up to $2.5 billion of conduit bonds that, again, that do not require volume cap. And this number is in large part driven by the city securizations that we're doing. 
uh, we now have done, we're actually working on our third one now. The first one was $170 million. The second one was about $430 million. And this coming up, uh, this one that we're working on right now is nearly $500 million. Um, but uh, as Eileen alluded to earlier, given all the volatility in the marketplace now, um, that we'll see if that deal um, continues to get executed. Um, so that's the multifamily bond financing resolution and our possible comments. I have a question. Yeah. Tim, if we, there, there have been certain uh, joint powers authorities and governmental entities that have issued government bonds which do not require a, uh, a SIDLAC volume cap of private activity bonds and taken an equity share to, to provide financing for um, a, a different type of financing for affordable housing. If Calichefade were to issue one of those government bonds as opposed to a private activity bond, which would which would this fall in? Would it fall under new money bonds not to exceed 250 or, or would it fall under the conduit bonds not to exceed 2.5 billion? So your point is very well taken. It would fall into either one of these and it all depends that if we decided to put our credit on it, then it will fall under the 250. And if we don't, it will fall under the 2.5. So for example, the city securitizations that we do, that does not, that we do not pledge our credit to those deals. So that's why they fall under 250. But if we decided to do governmental purpose bonds and it actually carries our GO pledge, which right now is double uh, A minus and A1, right? Um, then it would fall under the 250. So, why are we only asking for 250? Did we think that that is all we needed? <laughs> um, because I'm not aware of any massive use of governmental purpose bonds. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's because I didn't ask you, but it's 250 now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not aware. I've been focused on the 2.5. <laughs> I've been focused on the $2.5 billion. I'm not aware of other governmental purpose activities. How about this? If we exceed 250, then we can come back to the board. That's fair. <laughs> Those are my only comments, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Any other board members have comments on Resolution 2004? All right. Thanks, Tim. Let's move on. Oh, we need to. Do we vote? Yes. The way so, we do it in the past is we do them one at a time. Okay, yeah, so what about 03? We don't have an 03. Uh, Did we? Yeah. No. Oh, we voted on that. that. That was the Hayes Valley. We talked about it for an hour and we voted on it. Did we vote on that? Yes, yes, yes. we did. Delilah, did I hear you make a motion? No, this is Mike Gallagher. I have a question, and it's really a, a council question. I should connected with Claire ahead of time, so my apologies. I, it, my firm is a bond underwriter. I don't personally do any work on any transactions that come before, come through College of Bay, but some of my colleagues could. And I just want to confirm whether I, there's some I should, for conflict of interest purposes I need to abstain from, and I just want to uh, just kind of confirm if I should be abstaining from this. Is it Oric? <laughs> no, she's <laughs> my look at I know, I'm kidding. People, people, people. Did you abstain last year, Eileen? Yeah, you know, I, 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 know, I know I have in the past, I don't recall. Okay, so this is what we'll do. She is um, abstaining for the record. There you go, Eileen. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Better take thanks, sorry, right? Thanks for thinking about that, Eileen. Yes. Is there a motion? Uh, this is Jonathan Hunter. I'll move to approve resolution 20-04. Thank you, Jonathan. Is there a second? I'll second it. Teresa. Okay. We're seeing a motion and a second. The roll call, please. Ms. Avila Frias. Ms. Gunn. Aye. Mr. Gunning. Aye. Mr. Hunter. Aye. Ms. Johnson Hall. Aye. Ms. Japonda. Aye. Mr. Olmstead? Aye. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Yes. Mr. Prince? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sotelo? Aye. 
Chairman, resolution 20 04 is approved. Thank you. Uh, Thank this you. is Preston. I'm going to have to be leaving in a few minutes, so on your next vote, if I don't answer, sorry, I, I have to be going. We'll be a quorum. Will we have a quorum? I think we do. Yes. All right, see if you can hang, Preston. Let's go, Tim. Yeah. So, agenda okay. number six. Hey, <laughs> So agenda item six. So as I mentioned, um, each a multifamily site will have a bond financing resolution and we have a non-bond financing resolution now. So on page six, this is a resolution that authorized from the board is um, giving authority to staff to do non-bond financing activities for multifamily lending. Um, so <clears throat> for example, um, the kind of things that we're doing are we talked about a lot this federal financing bank, uh, this federal financing bank mechanism using HUD share. This would be an example of what this particular resolution authorizes. Um, so, uh, just as, as a sign on that, um, as far as FFB goes, at the moment we cannot put any new projects into FFB, but we still have an existing pipeline that we're clearing through. Um, this is an extremely uh, helpful program that we continue to advocate for, but at the moment it doesn't take in new uh, projects. Um, the other kind of things that this particular resolution uh, does uh, delegate to staff to do are that <clears throat> we can use the various different funds to finance our multifamily lending program as well. So for example, funds of the agency or um, as we talked about earlier on the last project, subsidy funds are under the agency's control. And a new one for this year is um, SB2 and AB101. This particular resolution does um, give authority for us to use these various funds to support multifamily lending as well. So that's, that's my comment for this resolution. Thanks, Tim. Any questions there? <clears throat> Resolution 2005. Is there a motion to accept? This is Teresa Gunn. I so move it. So move. Is there a second? This is Jonathan Hunter. I'll second. Thank you, Jonathan. There's been a motion and a second. Melissa, roll call. Ms. Alva Frias. Ms. Gallagher. Yes, uh, again, just the bond financing one, another one. This is the non-bond yeah, financing. Non-bond, okay, I, I. Ms. Gunn? Aye. <laughs> Mr. Gunning? Aye. Mr. Hunter? Aye. Ms. Johnson Hall? Aye. Ms. Japonda? Aye. Mr. Olmstead? Aye. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Aye. Mr. Prince? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sotelo? Aye. Chairman, resolution 20-05 is approved. Awesome, thank you. So moving on to agenda item seven, which is now switching over to the single family side. Um, resolution 2006 does give staff delegate authority to issue bonds for single family lending activities. Although we don't have any expectation to issue today, um, this resolution um, would, for example, limit any new bond issuance, if we were to do it, um, to mortgage-backed securities, which means no whole loans, and fixed rate bonds, which means no swaps. And um, in terms of this governmental purpose bonds, um, well, uh, for non for non tax exempt bonds, it would be a hundred million, uh, not to exceed dollar amount, hundred million dollars in this world. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we we haven't really relied on bond issuance as a funding model for single family, and uh, at the moment, there's no expectation that we use um, bonds as a funding model this coming year. Great, thanks, Tim. Any questions from board members? So because this is a bond resolution, is this one, um, uh, Board Member Gallagher, that you wanted to abstain from as well? Uh, yeah, it's just maybe out of abundance of caution. If you don't need a form, that probably makes sense. Thank you. OK. So Board Member Eileen Gallagher will be abstaining from item 7, resolution 20-06. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? This is Teresa Gunn. Uh, moving to approve resolution 
Ms. Teresa, a second. Uh, John, I'll second. Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. John, I'll Hunter, second. Hunter, second. Thank you, Jonathan. Next, Teresa Gunn. Um, roll call, please. Ms. Avila Frias. Ms. Gunn. Aye. Mr. Gunning. Aye. Mr. Hunter. Aye. Ms. Johnson Hall. Aye. Ms. Joconda? Aye. Mr. Olmstead? Aye. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Aye. Mr. Prince? Aye. And I do have to leave now. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the vote. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sotelo? Ms. Sotelo? Aye. <laughs> Chairman, Resolution 20-06 is approved. Awesome, All right, so moving on to agenda item eight, um, Resolution 2007. So this is one on a single family side in which we are given delegate authority to do our single family lending using the existing model of putting loans into mortgage-backed securities and to execute these um, sales of MBSs into the mortgage market using the t to be announced funding model. So this is a resolution that is um, uh, very much used by staff as we support our single family lending, which um, as you know is doing very well. Um, and in addition, it does also allow us to, to do a couple of things, just like on the multifamily stuff, Oh, so, so just like on a multifamily non-bond financing resolution, which uh, allows the agency to use our agency funds to support lending, this particular resolution does allow for um, a $20 million uh, allowance, or not to exceed our amount, if you will, to, um, to purchase subordinate loans with the agency's funds. Those are my comments for this resolution. Thanks, Tim. Any questions from board members? No. Um, I move approval of the motion. Thanks, Tom. Uh, do I have the poll? Yep. Thank you. Is there a Teresa second? Gunn, I second. Teresa Gunn, second. Thanks, Teresa. Seeing a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Ms. Avila Farias. Ms. Gallagher. Ms. Gallagher? Aye. Yes. Yes. Ms. Gunn? Aye. Mr. Gunning? Aye. Mr. Hunter? Aye. Ms. Johnson Hall? Aye. Ms. Joponda? Aye. Mr. Olmstead? Mr. Olmstead? Secretary Castro Ramirez? Aye. Mr. Prince? Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sotelo? Aye. Uh, Chairman, Resolution 20-07 is approved. Awesome. All right, final one, Tim. So moving on to agenda item nine, which is um, the application to SIDLAC for private activity volume cap this year. Um, Resolution 2008, this year, um, as Tia has alluded to in her prior comments, there is a competitive um, environment for volume cap in 2020. Um, it's the first time in a long time in which there's competitive um, um, demand for volume cap. So as such, we're not requesting any authority from the board for single family, for home ownership program. Uh, that this uh, aligns with uh, my earlier comment about we do not expect to issue bonds for single family. And for multifamily, um, as this connects to all the things that we've been telling the board about our mixed income program. And so for multifamily, we are requesting authority to request up to $1.5 billion of private activity volume cap to support multifamily lending. And again, this amount can be used 
either on the conjugate side equation or on the, um, the side of the equation that would require the CalHFS credit. But for the moment, we do expect most of what we get in 2020 to go to the conjugate side of the equation. Mm -hmm. So those are my comments for that resolution. Great, thanks, Tim. Any comments from board members? Not, is there a motion? Um, or, um, I, is that a motion? Chairman, um, is, is that, this is Delilah. Yes. I just want to understand the dynamic now that things are competitive at SIDLAC. How does this impact um, that competitiveness? Are we um, siphoning off um, authority that would otherwise be available in the marketplace, or are we encouraging people to come through us and work through us given our, our priority allocation? Can you explain a little bit more of the dynamic? So um, 1.5 billion is consistent with what we asked for last year. It's what we asked last year. Yeah. Um, we, and we did not receive 1.5 billion because the demand, um, the SIDLAC allocated bond via the demand survey. And I believe we were only allocated 600 million as part of the um, mixed income pool. So when SIDLAC does their demand survey, we'll put in a demand survey based on what the pipeline shows, but we have to go to SIDLAC and request an allocation amount, just like other issuers would. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion for resolution 20-08? Mr. Uh, I'll second. Teresa motion, Jonathan second. Thanks, guys. Uh, roll call, please. Ms. Avila Frias. Ms. Gallagher. Yes. Ms. Gunn. Yes. Mr. Gunning. Yes. Mr. Hunter. Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall. Ms. Japonda? I just want to make sure um, if I'm able to vote, if I should abstain since this is related to CIDLAC. No, you're a voting member. Okay. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Olmsted? Aye. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Aye. Mr. Prince? Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Sotelo? I'm sorry, I have to take my phone off of mute. Aye. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Chairman, resolution 20 08 is approved. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, for, t um, for letting me back 5,000. That one's for you, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you. Thank you, Tim. Okay. I must say I'm disappointed. I'm not going to be here, Mr. Rossley, for another year. I know. I'm just so sad about that. Um, but instead, I'll listen to you, Mr. Kabir. So before we get to um, the workshop, item 10 are all the various reports mm -hmm. that we have. And uh, Mr. Chair, did you want to ensure that none of the board members had any questions on any of the re reports? Are there any questions on our reports? I do like to see that variable rate swap stuff moving down. Almost gone. Yay! Can you give, can you give a hand for that? Yes, yes, we love that. We love that part. Um, in addition, we do have one last issue um, where we received some variances from Treasury on the new issue bond program that we did visit with Treasury when we were in DC and that went really well. So that's going well as we see all that she talked about behind us. Yeah, Thank so you. what Tia is referring to is that um, during the financial crisis, um, we, we worked really hard with Treasury to ask them to do various things for us so that we can survive the financial crisis. Um, and it, it, was, it has always been my personal mission throughout the various leaderships that we had at the agency 
to repay all of those obligations to Treasury. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily um, for me, I guess, that um, Tia has been very much on board in repaying all these things that Treasury did for us. And what Tia is referring to is that the last of the special things that it did for us, um, we provided a redemption notice a couple weeks ago, will be redeemed on 401. And after that 401 redemption, we would have unwound or repay all the special things that Treasury did for us. I can't tell you how pleased I am to hear that. Not only paying it back, but um, we got through that. Seems, it seems like a decade ago, but I know, Tia. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, I think I speak on behalf of me and you for that. <laughs> All right. All right. It's your turn now. Actually, okay. Can, Actually, we, sure. can oh, yeah. we make sure there's no other board matters before we move to the workshop? And then also public, public comment. Public comment. Mm -hmm. yep. Great, so item number 11, are there any other matters from board members to present? Good, hearing none, I open it up now to public comment on anything that's been said in the previous meeting. Any comment from the public? All right, hearing none, I can officially say it's your turn, Tom. Okay, great, well, good. Um, sorry. This is Teresa again. Just letting you know I need to pee a lot. Thank you. You guys have a good day. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you, board member. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye now. All right, well, good morning, Chair Gunning and members of the board. I'm Don Kavir, the agency's Chief Deputy Director, and today uh, staff would like to provide you with a mid-year update on our agency's 2019-20 business plan and operating budget. Um, your board packages uh, contained a detailed report outlining the agency's progress on each of the action items adopted as a part of the agency's annual business plan. So I'm going to limit my remarks to the most significant elements of the business plan, including updates on our lending activity and revised projections for the remainder of the year. And once I've completed my overview, I'm going to ask my two colleagues, uh, my director of home ownership, Tim Sue, and our director of multifamily programs, Kate Ferguson, to provide the board with a deeper dive into their programs and to give you a preview of some initiatives that they would like to pursue in the coming fiscal year. By way of review, the agency's business plan is made up of three overarching goals. First is to promote uh, statewide affordable housing production and opportunities for home ownership while maintaining fiscal sustainability and independence. Secondly, to continue to improve operational efficiencies through the use of technology, workforce planning and the implementation of best practices. And finally, to collaborate with other housing entities, lenders, and stakeholders who complement CalHFA's lending objectives and policy priorities in order to deliver effective and innovative housing solutions. With these goals in mind, staff developed strategic strategies and action items to support the achievement of the stated goals. Um, and those collectively became the underpinning of our agency's strategic business plan for 2019-20. Before I get started, I'd like to also note that there's a copy of the 2019-20 business plan uh, attached to your board report, and it includes a status bar that reflects the percentage of completion for each act action item called out in the plan. The first chart I have for you today provides a historical perspective on the single family program over the past eight years. As you can see, the program has been very successful in recent years, achieving record setting performance levels in each of the last three. Uh, through the midpoint um, this year, the program appears to be on track to surpass uh, the all time high of last year of $3.5 billion, um, which would be the highest ever reached with the agency. However, um, the effects of uh, the current pandemic um, on the financial markets and on business operations throughout California uh, place a cloud over what has been a very productive um, year so far. It is as yet unknown how current events will ultimately impact uh, program performance over the long term, but we are closely monitoring the program's pipeline and reservation activity, and we currently feel optimistic that we can hit the projections that, that we've outlined in the presentation today. Uh, this next chart simply reflects the year-over-year -year growth of the program in terms of the incremental increase in dollar volume of first mortgage loans securitized compared to the prior year. And the last is our projected increase uh, for this current fiscal year over last year. 
Last fiscal year, Cali Chafe recorded um, the best year in the history of the organization for single family lending, securitizing more than three and a half billion dollars in first mortgage loan purchases, assisting 12,050 uh, first time home buyers. As I mentioned previously, this fiscal year we've been on track to exceed last year's production levels and we are cautiously optimistic that we will hit those levels. However, we would continue to monitor the pipeline and we're going to assess, reassess as needed once tangible impacts of the coronavirus are identified, if, if identified at all. At the time the 2019-20 business plan was established, we were experiencing an unprecedented level of lending volume in an industry that is well known for its ups and downs. And accordingly, we conservatively um, increased our annual goal for this year by 33% to $2 billion in first mortgage loans and $110 million in subordinate loans for down payment assistance and closing costs. As it turns out, by the mid-year mark, the agency has securitized um, 7,973 first mortgages worth $2.5 billion, or 125% of the business plan objectives. Accordingly, our subordinate lending volume is also outpacing initial expectations with the agency purchasing $137 million of subordinate loans, or 125% of the goal as of December 31st. While one can never be completely confident of the factors driving demand, we believe that the low interest rate environment um, continues to spur purchase activity and certain programmatic changes have pulled demand forward. Uh, one likely driver from our estimation is uh, our effort to promote sustainable home ownership by increasing the minimum FICO score on our uh, loan products from 640 to 660 for both conventional and FHA loans. We believe that this adjustment to our program has pulled demand forward prior to the changes taking effect. And given, certain pipeline of uh, given the current pipeline of reservation reservations and our historical pull-through rate, which is about 85%, we expect to securitize approximately $3.9 billion in first mortgage loans and $220 million in subordinate loans by the end of the fiscal year. Um, I will let our director of home ownership, Tim, add more color to the subtleties impacting the agency's single family performance later in the presentation. But as with all things, change is inevitable. And so we will continue to uh, watch what's happening in the markets and, and with our pipeline of activity to see if there's any adjustments that we need to make in terms of our projections. The business plan also set forward a revenue target for the program of $23.5 million. At mid-year, fee income generated from single family uh, lending program was $45.4 million, or 193% of business plan goal. Um, uh, and we project that if we hit our uh, projection of $3.9 billion, we'll achieve about $65.9 million in revenue for the fiscal year. This uh, marked increase in revenue is primarily due to the robust lending levels we just described, combined with investor spec payups on the sale of our mortgage-backed securities. Currently, what we're seeing uh, in the market is that investors have a very strong appetite for California paper, and this is increasing what investors are willing to pay um, uh, to buy our mortgage-backed securities. See. Other significant accomplishments for the single family lending program through the mid-year point include the expansion of Cal HFA's product offerings to include the HUD uh, 184 Indian Home Loan Guarantee Program and the USDA Home Ownership Program for Rural Communities. Additionally, program staff anticipate the launch of the Fannie Mae Homestyle Energy Efficient Program prior to the end of the fiscal year and have completed program changes that will also incentivize new construction home ownership opportunities. So we're kind of excited about those, those new efforts to expand our menu of options. Another key strategy for the agency was to expand multifamily lending opportunities and unit production while addressing preservation needs and providing incentives for mixed income housing. The multifamily divisions uh, Lending target was 500.7 million in lending activity and 23.2 million in revenue for fiscal year 1920. At mid-year, multifamily lending volume is on track to meet its overall lending goal, having closed 41 million in permanent lending, 288 million in conduit issuance, and 11 million in special needs housing program loans, bringing the total lending activity at the mid-year mark to 340 million, or about 68% of business plan goal. 
while the composition of this lending activity is not what we had originally pre predicted, we are excited that the rollout of Calachave's mixed income program has been very successful, successful and is achieving the original intent of the program to expedite new construction of shovel-ready projects. And as you can see from the charts, the issuance of conduit bonds by CalHFA is a major indicator of the program's success because the issuance of conduit bonds is required to close the construction loan and get the projects underway. CalHFA expects to issue over a billion dollars in conduit bonds for projects in our pipeline this fiscal year, an all-time high for the agency. Many of these issuances convert to permanent loans in the CalHFA portfolio in the next 30 to 36 months once construction is complete and occupancy is stabilized. Currently, we expect total lending volume to reach about 1.3 billion or 260% of our overall lending goal for the fiscal year. And further, the present value of revenues from lending activities are expected to reach about 19.6 million or about 84% of overall goal. Another key strategy under goal one was to strengthen the agency's financial position by monetizing assets for liquidity while maximizing return on equity and investment. To, the, to this end, some notable efforts are the completion of the research necessary to stand up a bond recycling program with the goal of preserving California's oversubscribed and very valuable tax exempt bond volume cap. We are currently working to identify opportunities to preserve volume cap and deploy those recycled um, bonds on future transactions closing uh, next fiscal year. Additionally, we successfully renewed our final letter of credit supporting variable rate demand obligations and we intend to retire the last of these VRDOs this year, eliminating the need for this in the future. Also in the first half of the fiscal year, Standard & Poor's upgraded Calich uh, issuer credit rating or overall issuer credit rating to AA minus with stable outlook. And this returns Calachafe's issuer credit rating to the same level it was prior to the collapse of the housing market during the Great Recession. Finally, we consummated two conduit multifamily securitization transactions that Tim mentioned earlier with Citibank Community Capital uh, for loans on their balance sheet in a, a combined amount of $636 million. The nature of this transaction is both scalable, replicable, and provides the agency with additional fee income uh, and does not use any of the state's uh, volume cap or bond cap. We are hopeful that transactions like this will provide additional resources to support the agency's mission. Key strategies under goal two include improving operational efficiencies through the use of technology, workforce planning, and best practices. To this end, um, staff have uh, completed an RFP for optical character recognition software to extract and compare data from single family lending documents to streamline and automate what are currently manual processes. We've uh, selected a vendor and uh, intend to get underway prior to the end of this fiscal year. Uh, the agency continues to meet the highest standards in financial reporting for government entities receiving the second consecutive award for excellence in financial reporting from the Government uh, Finance Officers Association. We implemented a software package called Dynamics Budgets to streamline and automate the preparation of the agency's uh, annual operating budget. And after many years of talking about improving uh, software used for managing our multifamily and asset management programs, we have finally identified uh, a, a, a software package that we have great hopes will uh, allow for sort of a seamless uh, uh, integration of data between both our origination platform and our asset management platforms and thereby improve uh, and or eliminate manual processes and improve data collection and reporting um, for our program. Also of note is the implementation of a plan to transition the residual Keep Your Home California activities to the agency's loan administration, fiscal services, and IT department. Uh, this is the hardest hit funds that the agency administered on behalf of US Treasury during the financial crisis. The final treasury sweep on those funds uh, and the closeout of the program is set to occur sometime in May. And finally, staff successfully recruited and filled the key positions of Director of Multifamily Programs, Deputy Director of Multifamily Programs, and the Multifamily Credit Officer position. Uh, this is the first time in many years that we've had a full management team running the multifamily department, and we have big expectations of what they will be able to accomplish. 
So we're very excited about the app. <clears throat> Under goal three, um, College FA works closely with state partners and industry stakeholders to uh, further affordable housing production in a variety of ways. And the following is just a simple list of the committees and councils that the executive director or other uh, College FA staff uh, serve on in the furtherance of our mission. So I'm not going to go in and read all those details. Come on, list all. Of we're involved in quite a few <laughs> things. And with that, that, that concludes my remarks as it relates to an update on the mid-year business plan. Are there any questions? Open it up to board members at this point. Great presentation, Don. Okay. Did someone say something? Thank you, Don. As always, you do a very comprehensive uh, update. I, I appreciate all the work that you do because you make it easier for all of us to understand what's going on internally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if, there, if there's no further questions, I'm going to move on to the budget really quick, and then we'll dive into the programs a bit more. So um, at the same time that the board approves the uh, current year business plan, you approve the um, fiscal year 2019-20 annual operating budget, which enables the agency to pursue the goals outlined in the business plan. The approved operating budget represents both the resources and expenditure plan for the year and includes an expected resource budget of about $70.5 million and an expenditure budget of $41.8 um, very quickly here, the resources are significantly higher than originally anticipated, uh, primarily due to the increased fee income from our single family loan production and unanticipated multifamily loan prepayments and their related yield maintenance payments. Additionally, the increase in uh, loan repayments is directly attributable to a higher than expected prepayment speed on the remaining single family whole loan portfolio. And as Tim indicated in his presentation, uh, we're no longer doing whole loans, uh, you know, in, in the agency's balance sheet. And so this is sort of the runoff of the, the last of our portfolio. And with rates being low and activity being fairly high, the mortgage market, we're still seeing uh, a higher uh, prepayment speed than we, we had anticipated when we, when we built the budget. Um, let's see. The operating budget is trending about 3.3 million or about 16% under budget at the uh, mid-year mark, primarily due to salary and benefit savings from vacancies and cost savings from reductions in the use of consulting and professional services contracts. Overall, the operating budget is projected to uh, hit about 36.8 million, well within the approved fiscal year operating budget of uh, 41. Um, 41 and a half, or 41.7, sorry. And that concludes my remarks on the budget. Are there any questions related to the budget? It's just a wonderful story. I just, um, it's just, uh, it just feels good. Hey, I want to tell the board, um, there's a really neat summary, page 139, um, executive summary of the College FA operations. I know a lot of us have asked just what does the agency do, its successes. This is a good sheet to share and brag to people about this wonderful board we all serve on and the good work this, is, this agency is doing. So just wanted to draw that to your attention. And as well as some of the other reports, they're very helpful. I know we don't focus on them as much as we should, but please just take a look at the back reports. I think it does give you a strong sense of how well the agency is doing and what we do. So. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to comments from the public or see if there's any comments from the public. Did you guys? We still have more presentations. I know. Might so yeah. the public want to comment? Yeah, sure. All right. You're up, Tim. Okay. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to talk some more about home ownership. So I'm going to look at home ownership and single family through a different lens um, instead of talking about dollars and revenue. Um, I'd like to talk about the value of our home ownership program. Why do we do it? Who do we serve? And where are our customers? And why do they come to us? Um, and I'd like to end on some high level recap of what we have accomplished this fiscal year in terms of initiatives and also give a preview 
of our pipeline idea for next fiscal year. So first, let me just set the stage for the numbers I'm about to show to the board. These numbers are all calendar year numbers. Um, I think that I'd just like to provide a slightly different view. I think much of what we talk about is fiscal year, but I think for this particular presentation that I've done every year, I look at the, the production in terms of calendar year. Sometimes it's easier for me to wrap my head around uh, these numbers on a calendar year basis. So in the calendar year 2019, we have 14,142 families achieve the dream of home ownership. Um, that is a tremendous increase from the previous calendar year 2018. Uh, that's an increase year over year of plus 4,230 families. Um, and in terms of dollars, that translates into a delta or an increase of $1.5 billion. So I, as um, Don alluded to, when we look at the revenue side of the equation, we are able to do so much with this program in ways that we never dreamed of. Um, in terms of the breakdown of the production, 70% of the 2019 production was FHA, and 30% was conventional. Um, for better or worse, that number is now more skewed towards FHA instead of conventional because some of the changes that Fannie Mae is making to the HFA preferred product. And if we look at um, more recent number, let's just say if we're looking at the fiscal year um, that we're in now, that number is skewing towards uh, more towards 80-20. And this kind of started, if we look at the calendar year 2018, we were about 60-40 and sort of sliding and sliding towards the FHA side because of the changes that Fannie Mae is making to HFA preferred. And in short, they're in large part scaling back some of the subsidies they're providing to that program. Um, one of the things that I also talked to the board about in the past is market share. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the 2019 first time home buyer for all of California yet, but I suspect that we're in the high single digit in terms of market share. We're probably in that seven to, seven to nine percent range in terms of market share for first time home buyer. So, why home ownership? One of the things that I think Tia has talked about in the past is that we are serving a whole spectrum of uh, needs in housing. It's not just, um, let's say, the deeply affordable of uh, 30% AMI or 50% AMI. It, this is, home ownership is workforce housing. When you look at the spectrum of income that we're serving, about 10% of our borrowers in 2019 are, do make less than 50K in a year. But then if you look at this whole span here, you'll see also that about 70, about 70 percent of all our borrowers in 2019 actually make less than $100,000. So this is not the clientele that we're serving multifamily and is not intended to be the same clientele that we're serving multifamily, um, but this is workforce housing um, that we're supporting. And when compared to the statewide median income, um, these are 2018 numbers, the latest numbers we can get, um, of $86,000. You can see that more than half of our borrowers make less than the statewide median income of 56%. And when we look at about 150% of the 86,000, um, sort of ramping up to 150% of the statewide median income, you can see that almost 95% or 94% of our borrowers make less than 150% of the statewide median income. Hey, Tim, does this include our effort in missing middle, the new program we ramped up last this year? This is just home ownership. That's what was so this is the home ownership piece of the spectrum. We, um, Kate might get into our mixed income multifamily rental when she does her presentation. And, and we, we, I think that the way we look at these tools is that um, home ownership is not for everyone, and we put, we support and we advocate for sustainable home ownership, and it's a piece of the puzzle. But um, we like to think that we we're you know we we're ambidextrous. You know, we are people who are in multifamily rental housing, if they're ready to move into home ownership, we're there for them. So on to page four. Um, who are so who are our borrowers? Um, we are very proud of this slide that it does reflect the California diversity. 
Um, about 52% of our borrowers in 2019 are Hispanics, and about 8% are African American. Um, having, having said that, we're very proud of this. I do think that this does also reflect the marketplace we're in. Um, I think both Hispanics and African Americans are catching up in terms of home ownership to the, for example, the white and Asians. Um, so for them, for the Hispanics and the African Americans to have a larger slice of our production, it does make sense because they are more, they make up a bigger slice of the first time home buyer market than let's say for example the Caucasians and the Asians who, prop, who, who do make up a larger slice of the refi market. So where are our borrowers? So on to page five. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is page 20 for you. Sorry, page 20 for you. Um, most of our production are not, not surprisingly, um, center around areas that are still relatively affordable. So we don't have a lot of lending in, for example, Alameda or San Francisco. Um, you can see that you know, we have Riverside, St. Bernardino, Sacramento, L LA, and as you know, LA is uh, uh, it's, it's a very diverse place um, in which we have uh, uh, the movie stars along with areas further inland that are still somewhat affordable. So these top five counties uh, make up more than 50% of our production. And why come, so why do these borrowers come to us? Um, we are strong advocates of sustainable homeownership. Many of the, what we call overlays, so overlays are something that we require that's more, that's above and beyond what the GSEs require. So many of the overlays that we place onto our lending program are driving towards this question of sustainability. Is this a sustainable homeownership for that particular borrower? So we require education and counseling up front, and we also require that the transaction has a home warranty protection plan for a year. And we, we do have overlays in terms of underwriting that gets at the underwriting being a proven underwriting. We have a DTI, or debt to income ratio, not to exceed 45%. And we also have a minimum FICO score of 660. This is something that Don talked about earlier. Um, these, these particular requirements, as we change them, does um, sometimes bring forward demand. Um, but you know, these are good things that we offer, but why do people actually come to us? You know, what's our value add? If we don't have any, people wouldn't really come to us. And some of the, th these are sort of some of the big things that we offer. So for example, we do offer a higher combined loan to value ratio than sometimes the borrowers can get from their lenders. And on our conventional side, we also don't have a loan level adjustment fee for our conventional insured loans. And then the most important thing for this first time home buyer market is that we do offer them a state funded down payment assistance loan to help them close their loans. Um, the state is, um, managing a lot of things happening now. <laughs> um, but this is a, a, an ask that I sort of uh, put in every year, is that the best way for the state to help this program um, is to give us a permanent ongoing source for down payment assistance. I understand that this year there are, uh, there's a lot of focus on homelessness. And I assume that with the developments in the last couple of weeks, um, there could also be more focus on health care. Um, but as someone said earlier today, this is housing is something that's always going to be an issue, and then the state can support this program if we had a permanent source. So on page 23, um, this is a high-level summary of some of the things that we've done in this fiscal year. So on the, on the top half, these are the things that we've done in the first half, and on the lower half are the things that we've done in the second half. So some of the things we did in the first half, Don did address earlier, like adding the USDA program, adding the HUD Section 184 Indian Loan Guarantee Program. Um, what Don didn't talk about as much is that we also had, we also spent a lot of time, and you'll notice that I, I put a little asterisk next to the ones that were on a business plan. Um, so it's probably not a surprise to anyone 
um, that we do spend quite a bit of time in the year dealing with things that are not on the business plan just because there are changes that come externally. So for example, um, in the year, um, we a HUD issue a mortgage letter referred to as ML1906. Um, without getting into the details of that, it actually did require quite a bit of work from us and uh, it recommended three things and two out of the three things that recommended, we, uh, we changed our practices and we adopted them as best practices. So that requires some change. And the other thing that I sort of referenced earlier about Fannie Mae, um, Fannie Mae did scale back significantly the subsidy to provide into the HFA preferred program. So we spend also a lot of time and energy and resources to um, reframe, sort of reframe our program, sort of change our program so that it aligns with what Fannie Mae is doing on the HFA preferred product. So that took a lot of time as well. Um, in terms of things that we're doing this half, um, in March we changed our down payment assistance program so that it's now aligned so that if you are in the special program, a specialty program, um, your down payment assistance of let's say 3% or 3.5% does not have a cap, um, but if you're not in the specialty program, there is a cap of $10,000 on that program. And this is one of the things that um, we have been talking about um, for quite some time that our program is so successful, we, need, we do need to be careful about this precious resource that we have from the state for down payment assistance. Um, Don to talk about our effort, ongoing efforts to continue to launch more energy efficient programs. Um, and um, I think Don, Tia talked, I mean, Tia talked about a couple of board meetings ago, uh, we are working on a partnership with Apple as a potential new source of down payment assistance. Um, transitioning KYC servicing to loan admin, that's something that Don did talk about as well. And last but not least is that we are trying, uh, at the moment we do have a lender scorecard, but it's not based on the performance of the loans they produce. And um, as we become more sophisticated about the things that we're doing, we're going to include the loan performance in the lender scorecard. Um, and on slide 24, as I mentioned, uh, I'd like to offer a preview of some of the pipeline of ideas that we have for single family. So in the first half um, of the n this coming fiscal year, some of the things that we're thinking about is that, um, for example, um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are working on a nationwide standard documentation for subordinate note and deed. So this is, a, this is something that we've been working on for quite some time, and we have uh, already sort of changed our note and deed in preparation of this. Um, so we think we're very, very much sort of prepared for this event. Um, we're thinking about launching the FHA 203H program for disaster victims. This will enhance the current disaster program that we have, allowing the FHA loan to go up to 100% LTV. Um, Fannie Mae has, um, it's about to implement a new data upload system, uh, of, of format um, and we're, we, we're going to do the work necessary to adopt this. What this will allow uh, many of our lenders to do is that they, most of the lenders will be conforming to the standard and it will allow them to upload the data to our system rather than have to retype it over again. So this is something that's very important to us in terms of sort of data integrity. Um, last but not least um, is the, this OCR effort that Don did also touch on. Um, in, in a nutshell, OCR coupled with some very intelligent programming can allow us to do a lot less of what, what people refer to as stare and compare, meaning that we have data on the system, data and documentation, and we have people who are looking to see, looking for variances, and then let's say suspending files because of those variances. Um, we have the technology nowadays to be able to do this um, using software rather than having people to stare and compare. Um, so moving on to the next half of the second, uh, the second half of the next fiscal year, um, in addition to completing you know, the rollout of the OCR and AI, this intelligent software that is referred to as AI, um, I feel like anything we don't understand nowadays refers to AI. So, so we're going to complete the rollout of this OCR and the AI program. And we have a couple of things that we're kind of tracking. Um, CFPB has um, a patch, what's referred to as a patch, and that is, the, that is the term that people are actually using, not a term I made up, has a patch for qualified mortgage, which allows the GSEs to have a DTI of 
43%. Um, and we are tracking this carefully. There's some discussion of CF CFPB of not providing this patch or waiver for GSEs, and to the degree that, um, I'm sorry, let me just backtrack a there, this point this patch is, is that it allows them to take in loans that are higher than 43% DTI. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, we actually have a 45% DTI minimum requir uh, maximum requirement. So what if CFPB were not to extend this patch to the GSEs, we may have to lower our DTI from 45% to 43%. So I believe that this particular patch sunsets on January 1st, 2021. So then um, we can see this one coming, and we'll have to sort of rejig, uh, re, re, um, reframe our program accordingly if they were to lower to 43% DTI. And last but not least is that the uh, Fannie Mae's and the Freddie Mac's of the world, the GSEs, um, even in today's environment, um, they do continue to work on their duty to serve mandate. Um, as many of you might know that um, there is also an effort to privatize the GSEs, so I feel that their effort on this front is not what it was prior to, um, I think, the mandate to privatize the GSEs. But nevertheless, they are continuing to work on this, and that to the degree that they were to um, implement certain program under the duty to serve, we will quickly follow. So a good example of that is when we uh, adopted Fannie Mae's manufactured housing program um, I believe that two, this is in 2018, when they rolled out their manufactured housing program in August of 2018, we quickly followed suit, and I think that we'll roll out our program um, for conventional manufactured housing uh, a, couple of, a couple months after Fannie Mae and made the announcement. So those are my comments for home ownership. Great, thank you, Tim. Kate, your yeah. turn. Oh, did you want to see if there are any questions on home ownership? Any questions on home ownership? No questions. This is uh, uh, Board Member Tina Johnson Hall, but I, I do once again want to underline how phenomenal those numbers are. Yes. Um, as compared to what I've seen working at various conventional institutions, um, and it's definitely something that I think we should highlight. I uh, also wanted to just mention real quickly that my daughter just happened to have gone to one of the counseling sessions. She actually referred to it as a coaching session versus counseling session. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that maybe that's some language that we may want to adopt um, because um, what I've seen, and I think the reason that the, the program is successful is not so much that we're trying to fix people's problems, but we are actually coaching them to have a better understanding of where they are. And so they are no longer afraid to actually apply for a loan, yeah, yeah. which is a whole different metric. Thank you, that's a great comment. So, um, so on that note. Hi, this is Suzanne with OPR. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, thanks so much. Uh, again, really impressive numbers on the last presentation. And, um, and I congratulate Tim and all the staff on those. Um, I'm also just aware, you know, with the current situation, and I don't mean to jump the gun, but um, but certainly there will be some amount of recession. We're still figuring out what, to what degree that and what that will look like. But I'm just curious, you know, knowing that HSA has been the leading entity at the state to um, to put forth. Um, uh, um, foreclosure prevention programs in the past. You mentioned that you're just wrapping those up from 10 years ago, and now here we are again. So, you know, those 14,000 families that were served in the past year, some of those families may not be in need of those programs. So, you know, what what does that look like for HSA to pivot towards foreclosure prevention um, in the near future? And what does that take for you all? And what what would be maybe your ask to the state to support that or the I, I don't know how that. Would so Suzanne, the Keep Your Home California was um, funded by the, the federal government as part of the hardest hit funds. There were 18 states that were considered hardest hit states. The Obama was. So that $2 billion came in from the federal government to, for that program. And so because that was a federal program and we are following um, Treasury's um, compliance and regulations, that's why we're on the time frame to um, wind down and wrap up that program. 
Treasury has already given us notice that they are coming in with their last compliance review of the program, and we plan to sweep those, uh, Treasury plans to make a sweep of that fund and basically close that program down May 29th. May 29th. So um, I'm not sure that CalHFA has an ask of the state. I think we tried to coordinate several years back on some of the mortgage settlement dollars. Um, but um, that never came to fruition. So at this point, we don't really have an ask of the state for a foreclosure prevention. And I would just add too that the infrastructure has been dismantled um, yes. along the way. Because it was Obama money. Any other questions from board members? If not, we'll switch over to Kate to give a presentation on multifamily programs. And I am here and happy to be the last presenter before everybody gets to adjourn for lunch. But um, I'm sorry to say that my TS10 remote desktop connection is not working, but Steve Gallagher is in the room and ready to do the presentation in my stead. I will remain on the line if there are any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am serving as your official Kate Ferguson stand-in this morning, but I luckily have her uh, comments and everything from the presentation that we worked on. So uh, you have the clicker down? Right? Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. No, you can do it. If you don't mind. Nope, don't mind. Just an abundance of caution. Thank you, Melissa. Sorry, we're just uh, disinfecting over here uh, before we get going. <laughs> are, are you reality? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll run through um, just a more detailed mid-year update, kind of go through some of those numbers that Don already shared, and uh, away we go. So our production and lending goals and achievements and the multiple strategic initiatives that we've focused on, um, you can see just a summary on the screen right now. Um, as you know, we're always facing challenges in the ever-changing industry and environment, and this most recent thing is uh, yet another example of that. Um, but we'll take a quick look ahead at our expectations for the rest of this year and also kind of a preview of fiscal year 2021. So I'm going to refer to a slide that Don showed previously related to our uh, multifamily lending volume. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to walk you through our methodology for developing the projections. So we have based this on the most current month end uh, pipeline, so the end of February, when we looked at our projections. Uh, so based on that pipeline, we wanted to be conservative with our uh, estimates. Um, so any project that was scheduled to close in June 2020, we actually push that to the next fiscal year. So there's a chance that it could still close in this fiscal year, but rather than um, just assuming that they're all going to stay on track, we actually push those off. Um, so when we look at our 2021 production count later, it would, it would be part of that. Um, we did this simply just because of the fluid nature of the deals and the fact that closing dates can be pushed for a variety of um, market reasons or uh, project of the partnership issues, all sorts of things. So just want to make sure you understand that before we get into anything here. Um, also want to talk about, as part of our, product, our projection methodology, we work with developers to understand the funding cycle and the timeline for each loan. So there's a, a graphic on your, on your screen right now you can see um, that kind of just gives a high level over, overview of that. Um, I know at the last board meeting, Kate walked through the nature of being a perm lender and she discussed the fact that the loans we commit to today won't actually fund for 36 to 48 months. So this simplistic slide gives you a high level review of the average project funding cycle and timeline. And so what it shows is that the project life cycle from concept to stabilization and perm loan conversion is up to six years. Um, each phase includes specific activities that are being undertaken by the developer and by CalHFA. And the pre-development phase includes activities that define the nature, size, and scope of the project via the definition of the project concept and initial uh, feasibility analysis. So site identification, control, and acquisition uh, take place over another 12 months. 
So prior to developing a financing plan, the developer is out already 24 to 30 months in. These activities are generally funded via developer cash resources. And then the construction loan stage is when the developer is working on the design, plans, and specs, permitting, and approvals for the project. So funding applications, equity investor selection, and the negotiation of all the related documents ensue. And at the closing of the construction loan, which is 36 to 48 months after the pre-development starts, college phase conduit issuance is closed. So this is followed by 18 to 24 month construction period and an additional, additional 12 to 18 months to get the property leased and occupied. And finally, college phase perm and subsidy loans close three to four years from the time we issue our initial commitment. So I know that's a lot, but like I said, we have the slide to kind of just do that at a high level and show you what we're dealing with. And if I could just stop right here, Mr. Chair, if you remember um, as part of my evaluation, some of the um, conversation was around methodology and forecasting yes. on the multifamily side. Yes. And so what Steve has walked through right now for the purposes of the board members is trying to understand that forecasting and methodology. We are highly dependent upon the market but to the extent that we make those projections and, and, and forecasting, it's based upon what Steve just laid out to you. So we want to just make sure that we made that clear for the board. Could I just add to you that, that obviously, even if you have a nice, well thought out methodology that you're deploying the situations we're dealing with today versus a few years back when right. it was, we're going to get rid of private activity bonds, we're doing tax reform, all the uncertainty surrounding those events drives changes to sort of timelines in these developments that are sort of uncontrollable. You can kind of set up your best guess and put in the right parameters, but at the end of the day, you're still vulnerable to outside events that seem to occur more frequently than we would like. Thank you, so. Yes. So with, with all that in mind, uh, the next slide is one that Don showed you before. Um, and as he said, at mid-year, the multifamily lending volume is on track to meet our lending goals with 68% of the business plan goal already closed by the end of uh, calendar year 2019. Our production in the first and second half of 1920 fiscal year has been driven by our mixed income program and the additional resources we have been able to commit for subsidy loans since the summer of 2019. Additionally, by coupling the expanded mixed income program with our permanent and conduit programs, we have been able to grow the, those pipelines as well. That being said, you'll notice in the chart that the composition of our lending business has not been what we originally expected when developing the 19 to 20 goals. So with the increased subsidy dollars and the state tax credits coming into the mixed income program, we have been able to expedite shovel ready projects and move them quickly toward construction closing. This is evident in the revised year end uh, projections which contemplate one billion or a little over a billion in conduit bond issuance in the 1920 fiscal year, which as Don said, would be a new record for us. As discussed, while the College Fay permanent and mixed income program loans are fully documented at construction loan close, they do not fund until the construction loan is paid down and converted to permanent financing. So as we just discussed, these conduit issu <coughs> excuse me, issuances will translate to significant increases in the perm and subsidy loan production 36 months from now. Okay, so this chart that you're looking at now is really what it's all about, the units, the units that we're creating um, or that uh, we're preserving. So as discussed, the conduit closings coincide with the closing of the construction loan. And we count the units at that time given that it is the point in time when pr unit production begins. So this slide shows you the following, that multifamily lending activity in fiscal year 1920 will result in the production of an estimated 4,000 379 units of affordable housing. 40% of those units, or 1,769 of them, are the result of our conduit business, followed by the closing of the new mixed income program loans, which total 1,287 units for 29% of the total. Now our perm lending unit count is lower at only, I'm sorry, 550 units, which are related to refinances and legacy perm loans that are uh, at or below $5 million. These small loans amount to only 13% of the units and their total is expected to shrink as we focus on large permanent loans which accompany our mixed income subsidy loans. The special needs housing program loan closings produce 773 units or 18% of the total production 
And as you know, this business will also continue to shrink as a proportionate share of overall production as we continue to wind down of the SNP program. So also of interest on this slide is the overall affordability levels of these new units. Um, you can see that 85% of our new production is in the 50 to 120% AMI level. With those at 80% AMI and above, totaling 11%. So this is a trend we expect to continue to see as we receive the next installment of AB 101 resources designated for the mixed income program. Almost there. Okay, so um, as, as I just stated, we continue to wind down the SNP loan program with the last loans passing through the pipeline by the end of fiscal year 2021. Um, one of our expected growth strategies for 1920 is to expand the conduit issuance to underserved communities, um, which was less of a focus given the limits on bond cap and the deployment of the MIP related resources. The number three on this list, which is monitoring the market acceptance of MIP has been a constant for us this year. Um, we have actively worked with our constituents to ensure that our program remains as efficient and relevant as possible. So by fiscal year end, we expect that the entirety of the $180 million in MIP funds will be fully committed along with all of the $200 million in related state tax credits. The Asset Management Department continues to work with existing owners to identify preservation opportunities and Sheena Ko, who is our credit officer, has been working very closely with Kate and with Don's assistance to identify the uh, outside support we need to meet our underwriting needs and produce training materials as we grow the portfolio um, with a continued eye towards quality and risk mitigation. I think we got two slides left, we're almost there. Um, right now it seems, um, it seems obvious to identify uncertainty as a challenge to any strategy based on what we're doing. Um, given the events of recent days, we're aware of the scarcity and value of every resource we rely on to make these programs successful. So the state tax credits that go with our mixed income program um, are subject to annual appropriation. We know not to take those for granted. Additionally, we have a very competitive bond cap environment with many differing priorities, which will compete for this limited resource. And we know the market's gonna be stressed from all this COVID-19 stuff. So we know that there's still a need for affordable housing where that remains unchanged. We're going to continue our efforts to use every resource available to us and continue promoting production. And then this last slide is just a preview to look ahead. So very quickly, our priorities going forward will include some new items. We're going to be closing out the HUD TCA and 811 activities in the next year. Um, we'll continue to look at all of our program offerings to ensure that we're using resources wisely. Um, our systems upgrade that Don mentioned earlier for asset management will roll out uh, first and then we're also going to be looking at the front end side of that to follow. And with that, um, we can take your questions. Questions from board members? Awesome. Well, thank you for the presentation. Kate, thank you for your work. Any comments from the public? Good. Operator, Tia? operator, do we have any um, one in the queue queue for questions? If you would like to ask a question, please press star one from your phone and speak your name clearly. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one from your phone. Seeing no questions from the public, Mr. Chair. I think that's a wrap. Hey, everybody, thank you. Be safe. Stay inside. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.